Welcome to our show. And today Jake's going to talk to us about some of the tools we've discovered and are continuing to find that will help you to do your job easier, organizing a new food co-op in your community, talking to the people in your community, and working within your group to better and more efficiently get this thing off the road. On the road, mind you. So with no further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Jake. Jake is a food co-op development specialist with Food Co-op Initiative. He's been with us for a year now. And I uh, hope that uh, you've all had a chance to interact with him at some point. But if you haven't, after this, you'll want to give him a call and talk to him about technology. Take it away, Jake. All right. Thanks, Stuart. Um, hi, everyone. As uh, Stuart mentioned, my name is Jake Schlachter. I, I work with Stuart uh, over at Food Co-op Initiative. And uh, mostly these days, I'm designing training for co-op organizers like yourselves. Um, before joining the organization last year, I organized a new food co-op in Ohio. I live in New Jersey now. Uh, so I've been through it once. I know what you're up against. Uh, and I've, since joining here, I've also talked to, uh, to dozens of, of other startups uh, and have seen we have a lot of challenges that we share. Um, before I started organizing in 2008, I was a professional software developer. Uh, and I still eat, sleep, and breathe the stuff. So uh, it gives me a good background on some of this, and uh, absolutely, please feel free to get in touch with any questions you might still have after the session. Oh. I want to thank you all for taking the time out of your day to come to my webinar. Um, I'm sorry that our format uh, doesn't allow for two-way uh, speaking to each other, but uh, so just imagine me uh, sitting here on my side of the glass, and you're on your side, and there are dozens of people that you can't quite see, but uh, they're sitting just nearby. Uh, but keep in mind that we're all here together and that we can talk with each other through the questions box that you've got on your toolbar. So anytime you have a question, just uh, type it up. Joel's going to be monitoring that. Uh, and then at a few points during the talk today, I'll stop and, uh, and ask Joel for questions that have come up. And then we'll also have some time at the end uh, for any that we haven't gotten to yet. And I, I did check with Joel. Our webinar will be officially over at 3 p.m. Eastern today. But if you have a question that wasn't answered, Joel's willing to stick around. I'm willing to stick around. Uh, so please, stick around if you have any extra questions, and, uh, and we'll handle those um, after the end. And then, of course, you can, you can email me if, uh, if you're not able to stay late after class. All right. So uh, today, we're going to talk about uh, two major subjects. One is the, uh, the common challenges that we share uh, when we're starting a food co-op, or actually just about any organization that's based on um, mission-oriented uh, outreach. Uh, so around engagement and institutional knowledge, collaboration, and, uh, and then self-serve processes. The other major subject is uh, designing criteria that we can use to think a little bit more critically uh, about potential solutions that we might use for some of these challenges. But before we get there, I want to, uh, to ground us in uh, why we're talking about systems at all. So hopefully you've all seen the four cornerstones and three stages uh, picture before. Uh, this is a really great framework for starting uh, our food co-ops or, or a lot of uh, different organizations. Um, the three stages are uh, stage one, organize. Um, that's when we're primarily focused on our democratic association which is really about developing new relationships. Um, the most important data we have in this stage is really the relationships we have with other people, with the public, with our members. And then as we move through the stages, uh, through feasibility, planning, and then finally into implementation, we're really talking about setting up the business, the cooperative enterprise, and, and hiring professional staff to do that. The four cornerstones on the outside uh, are vision, talent, capital, and systems are present in each one of these stages. Um, and they have different, um, different features in, in each of them. Um, today, though, we're going to kind of restrict ourselves to really just talking about this bottom left-hand corner, the systems that are going to be of the most importance to us uh, during the organizing stage. So imagine this was your co-op's office. You would show up at 9 AM. You'd get to work with your colleagues, leave at 5. Um, a lot of things I imagine about organizing your co-op would be different. I mean, you could work with people face-to-face. -face. You'd, you'd have a filing cabinet. 
Um, of course, you know, most co-ops aren't organized this way. We, we don't have an office at, at all, and, uh, and we probably aren't working on the co-op full time either. Um, and without a central place to work, you know, we can't use a paper filing cabinet that everyone has access to. We talk on the phone instead of face-to-face, -face, uh, and the meetings need to get scheduled around you know, our, our lives. People might keep each their own copy of files, uh, which very quickly get out of sync, uh, as I'm sure you know. So all of this is really a hassle. Um, everything that doesn't fit together smoothly costs us. It costs us money. It costs us time. It costs us enthusiasm. Uh, but it generates friction, which saps the forward momentum of our project and our people. So think of an ice rink for a minute. With so little friction, giving something a small push sends it sliding down the ice for 10 yards. Uh, now think of concrete. <laughs> give something a small push and nothing much happens. And give it a big push and it, it falls over. Uh, so we're organizing new co-ops on concrete. But we want that concrete to behave like ice. We want to give things small pushes and get really big results. And we don't want to have to tell our other volunteers that they have to give big pushes. Uh, they might not enjoy volunteering. And we don't want to tell our potential members that they can't find the information about the co-op that they're looking for on their own, that they have to call someone. Uh, and we certainly don't want someone who's, you know, who says they're on the membership list, but we don't have a record of their payment uh, because we didn't you know, manually enter it in all of our different systems and copies of files. Um, that would be bad. So what do we do then? Well, if we have smoothly running systems set up during our organizing stage, it's a little bit like putting grease down on that concrete. Things that used to take big pushes are now much easier. Uh, things don't get lost. Our neighbor gets that information she needs to decide to become a member. People who have never heard, of, people that we've never heard of, are hearing about our co-op uh, from other people that we've never heard of through digital word of mouth, i.e. Facebook and Twitter. There's one more part of all of this. Uh, we're not machines. We're people, and we don't function like machines. So if something is unpleasant to do or a system is unpleasant to use, then we'll start subconsciously resisting it. If our file cabinet isn't user-friendly, then instead of filing our papers, we'll put them in a pile that we call to file. Uh, and they'll never get filed, and now we don't have a filing system anymore. We have a pile of papers. So we need systems that run smoothly so that we actually use them. If they're not fun to use, then we'll work around them. At all at the expense of the long-term health of our co-op. So what are the tasks that we need smooth running systems to accomplish? Well, I find that they fall into four main types. Uh, engagement is about uh, developing relationships, and, and really developing relationships on a mass scale with the public. Institutional knowledge is that filing cabinet that we'd have in our office. Um, so who knows what, and then how does that knowledge become something that the co-op knows rather than just that one person. Collaboration. So without that co-op office, we often connect over the internet, but there's, there's really no substitute for face-to-face -face contact. So is that something that we can do on the internet these days as well? And then lastly, self-serve. So this is about putting all of the information that we have out there for people to find so that they don't need an intermediary uh, and that we're not accidentally being the bottleneck. So these are needs that are widely shared. It's not just your co-op, it's every co-op. Uh, and it's not just co-ops either, but really all mission-oriented associations. Uh, we're in very good company as we try to solve these problems. We have the combined intelligence of literally tens of thousands of people in this country alone who we're connected to by the internet. And many of them have done this before. Uh, and they've even sometimes built new software solutions for the task that seemed like they were just made for us. But how do we choose which software to use? Well, before I answer that, I want to tell a little story. So this past Saturday, I'm sitting at home, I'm working on this webinar, and I get a call from my sister. And she says, hey, I've got some pictures to hang. How do I do it? And my sister, not the handiest person. It occurs to me, my friend Bob and I were having a beer last week, and he was telling me that he had just hung up some pictures around the house. So I tell my sister, I'll call Bob, I'll get back to her. I call Bob and say, hey, when you were hanging those pictures last week, what did you use? Bob says, oh, it was easy. I just hammered a nail into the wall and hung up a picture. I say, okay, my sister needs to hang some pictures. Do you think that would work? He says, sure thing. I do it all the time. I say, thanks. We hang up. Now, I know my sister's going to need a hammer, uh, so I get online to do some research. And the Internet's pretty great for product research. So there I am. 
I'm online, I'm reading reviews, recommendations, and after a little while, I'm pretty sure I've got the perfect hammer uh, in the world. I call my sister back and say, hey, don't worry, it's a snap. All you need to do is drive in a nail with a hammer and then hang your picture on it. My friend Bob did this last week. He said it's a breeze. I even found you a great hammer. Here's a link. She says, thanks. We hang up. So great. Problem solved. I'm feeling pretty good. You know, help my sister out. Don't think any more of it. This morning, I get a call. It's my sister again. I say, hey, how the pictures go? She says, so, so. I ordered the hammer you told me about. It came today. I drove the first nail, hung up a picture. It worked great. I drove the second nail, hung up another picture. It was a little crooked, but easy enough to straighten out. I drove a third nail, hung up the last picture, but as soon as I let go of it, it crashed and broke on the floor. It crashed, I said. Yeah, it crashed. I said, what kind of picture was it? She says, it was a painting I did in a 40-pound frame. Oh. So it occurs to me now that I didn't ask my sister how heavy the pictures were, and that that would have been useful information. It also occurs to me that Bob didn't ask me how heavy they were either. So what happened to Bob? Well, Bob's a great guy. I mean, we go to church together, you know, we go to the pub, and he had just solved what I thought was the exact same problem last week. What I didn't realize is that Bob is not a world-class handyman. Uh, he'd only seen one problem of this type before, and he'd solved it with a hammer. More importantly, he has not seen a problem of this type before that cannot be solved with a hammer, so he doesn't know what other tools might be more appropriate, nor what factors should influence the decision. Those are the kinds of things we call wisdom, and we generally acknowledge that it comes from experience. Now, if I would have called the hardware store, the first thing they would have asked me is, oh, how heavy is it? The second thing they would have asked me is, what type of material are you trying to hang it to? Because there's a big difference between hanging something in wood and hanging it in drywall. Now, Bob's a great guy, and he wouldn't steer me wrong, but I made a mistake when I confused him with a professional with a large amount of experience in this domain. And even though I found the absolute best hammer through the amazing intelligence of the Internet, uh, it wasn't enough to compensate at that point for asking the wrong question. So what questions should we ask from all of this? Well, you know, watch out for your friend Bob, who's done this before. Um, has he really? Or has he done something that, that looks a lot like it, but is a little bit different? And then, are there people who have done it before? Uh, well, that's the good news. Yes, there are. There are tens of thousands of them. They're online, and they're talking about it. Uh, and of course, I'm here at Food Co-op Initiative and would be happy to, to talk with you as well. Uh, I've hung a few pictures myself in my day, and, uh, and I also collect stories of lots of others. Uh, so I know people I can direct you to as well. And perhaps most importantly, can we insist on some kind of objective criteria uh, for choosing systems? You know, rather than just choosing something because you know one of our friends uh, has used something before, has a hunch about it. Um, you know, are we being responsible for our members by by putting all of our eggs in that basket? Um, are there criteria that we could use instead to evaluate different possibilities? And the answer is yes. Uh, and in just a moment, I'm going to share a, a list that I've cooked up that your co-op can use to evaluate. Uh, potential systems you might employ. And I'm also going to recommend a couple of systems that, um, that we found that stack up pretty well against this list of criteria uh, and that you might want to consider as you, as you go through this selection process yourself. But first, we need to know a little bit more about the problems we're trying to solve. So let's talk a little bit more about the domain. It's four types of systems, uh, starting with engagement. So as we consider the systems we might want to use for engagement, it's uh, important to keep our goals in mind. So I've, uh, I've brainstormed a couple of goals. Uh, it might be similar to the goals that, that you've got for your engagement plans. Uh, you might add a, a few to these. But essentially, it's really about developing relationships. Uh, the technology just allows us to develop these relationships on a wider scale. So one-to-one -one and, uh, and one-to-many. I'm not going to really be talking about these much today. I'm going to be talking about them in an upcoming membership recruitment workshop. But what I wanted to say was let's not forget about face-to-face -face communication. Uh, in many cases, that's the best technology for developing relationships. Uh, but it's not as flashy as social media, so it can often get overlooked. Um, where technology really helps us out is in reaching a mass audience. So this is like a broadcast category. We're putting our information out uh, on the web, by newsletters, 
and through traditional PR channels like newspaper and television. I do want to highlight a few social media platforms, though, as there's, there's just really no alternative. I mean, the alternative to using Facebook is just not reaching uh, that community. Now, where the web differs from the old school mass medium is that it also allows us to listen on a mass scale as well as broadcast. So if you truly want to engage with the public, uh, you have to really demonstrate to them that you're listening as well. First step is on your website. So I follow a few blogs, and the mark of a good blog is where the author is engaged with his readers. Uh, simple things like just acknowledging each comment, thanking the, the poster, uh, it shows that you're listening. I, I wouldn't really have a, a comment section without being willing to, to go through it and, and see who's commenting on things. Um, we can listen even faster with social media. I mean, this is really what, what it's for. Uh, we all know how to post to Facebook, I'm sure, but what really builds relationship is the interaction and engagement we have with our readers. So even if that's just a simple thank you for sharing a post or, uh, or putting a comment on our wall. And then we can do this on an even bigger scale uh, with Twitter. So whereas Facebook restricts us to listening in on our friends, uh, Twitter is like the world's largest cocktail party. We can listen to any conversation going on across a huge people around the world. And when we find something that interests us, uh, we can introduce ourselves and say hello. So this is a screen cap of TweetDeck. Uh, it's the name of an excellent Twitter tool that helps make a little bit of sense of that information stream. So here I've, uh, I've defined uh, a search on a term that I'm interested in. You know, this could be anything. I've, uh, I've set up a search for people talking about co-ops with the, with the hashtag here. And then TweetDeck also does some data mining for you. So at the bottom, you can see a list of terms uh, and people that come up commonly within this search space. So you can use the same tool and do it in your local community uh, around your co-op, your organizing group, or other topics to, to find out what the popular topics are, what conversations you should be listening in on, and then who the most networked people are in your community. Uh, you know, who are the, who are the connectors? Uh, those are the people that you want posting about your co-op. So, uh, so go make friends. Now, we also want to listen to blogs, newspapers, and anyone else talking about our co-op. Now, there are companies that specialize in media clipping services, but, you know, really, for free, it's hard to beat Google Alerts. Uh, so here's an example that, that I use. Uh, I've set up some search terms here. And anytime something new comes online, be it a blog, newspaper, or website that mentions food co-ops or a food co-op initiative or the occasional chicken coop, uh, I hear about it. And then you can have these alerts emailed to you or you can get it on your RSS feed, but it's, it's really a fantastic tool. But don't neglect the basics. Um, most of our engagement is probably still by phone, um, maybe a shared info at email address, and then the trusty PO box. So, you know, make sure you have good systems for receiving communication through these and that it gets to uh, the people it needs to go to. And then don't hide this information on your website either. Uh, you want it to be easy, very easy for people to find this information um, when they come to your site uh, and, and no one really wants to, to hunt for it. And you don't want to make them hunt for it. Now, Google Voice is a great option for, um, for setting up a phone number. It's uh, much better than having one person's telephone be the co-op contact number. You can set up a new phone number through Google Voice, and uh, it, pretty much just like you would set up a shared info at email address. It, you can see here a couple of examples. Uh, it stores records of calls. Uh, it even attempts to transcribe voicemails uh, and email them out. Uh, sometimes this works better than others. It's usually pretty entertaining. But um, anyway, it certainly helps that uh, it's not a single person then that's answering the phone uh, for the whole co-op. And did I mention, it's free. So our last concept in this space is uh, what I call mass relate. So we're not exactly broadcasting here, and we're not exactly listening, but what we want is for people to care about us and, and care about our co-op, uh, to develop a relationship on a mass scale. So there are two important concepts for doing this, stories and faces. 
So we are creatures of stories. There's a slew of new research into how central the narrative is and how our brains are actually wired. Uh, if you want to persuade or if you want people to care, uh, you should tell a story. A great system for written stories is uh, to create a story bank. So you collect the short testimonials, stories uh, from your members about why they joined or why the co-op matters to them or whatever else is going on, and then look for ways to share those stories uh, with others. And then when you have a story bank, I mean, think about creating this today and the value it will have for the co-op in five years or in 10 years uh, so that anyone who's ever putting together a presentation for the lifetime of the co-op uh, and needs a story for it knows where to look for that and can find stories from all the way back when your co-op is still organized. The other concept is faces. Uh, we need a face in order to relate. And so here's a website from Charity Water, and you just immediately see, first thing, uh, this nice colorful image of a face close up. So we're creatures of faces, too. Uh, we see faces in clouds. <laughs> we see faces in tortillas. Uh, the mind wants to see a face anywhere it looks. So make sure that your communications have faces for people to see. Uh, good close-ups of your members and of your leadership. So this is where YouTube and Flickr can really help. Uh, you can set up channels on both of these two social media outlets uh, that people in your co-op can then use to publish their own videos, publish their own photos that they might be taking at events uh, and so forth. So it really distributes that workload uh, off of your shoulders. So we're defining and refining our engagement systems all the time, uh, but ultimately we're going to measure our success against how well we inform, listen, persuade people to care, and then ultimately recruit people to join our co-op. All right, next up, institutional knowledge. So again, it's good to keep uh, in mind some, some goals that we have. So um, this is what it means to me. You know, we're, we're sharing knowledge. And, and think about it, it's not just the people that are working on our co-op now, uh, but really, who's going to be working at our co-op in five years or in 10 years? What kind of information are they going to, to wish they, they still had access to? Uh, it may be after you know, we have moved on. Uh, so we need good systems to store that and keep the institutional record. We also want systems that support us in analyzing the information that we have. Uh, information is not anywhere near as useful to us as we're making decisions as intelligence, um, you know, after we analyze that, that data. So we want our systems to help us with that too. A good example is recruitment. You know, are, we, are we recruiting faster now than we used to? Are we recruiting slower? Those are, those are important questions. Um, but if we only keep a list, uh, we might not know how to answer them. So what sorts of information does our organization need to know about? Records. We have records of all types. Every organization does. Uh, we're going to want a very good distributed filing cabinet that everyone can access to keep track of them all. And Evernote does this really well. Uh, software is free. There's also a paid version, like five bucks a month, um, that allows you to share your filing cabinet with others. So if one you know, if the organization has one paid copy, then everyone else can use free copies. It works great, uh, highly worth it. So this is, a, this is a screen cap of my Evernote, and uh, you can see it's the tags on the left-hand side that I use to create like a, a folder system. And I've alphabetized, and I've got dates, and then if you look at the note in the main body, you can see I'm, I'm clipping some uh, news articles about co-ops that I find. I've tagged this one, co-ops and food co-op initiative and news. Uh, does a great job. I can now share this, um, and then I can find it in any of the folders that I've tagged those, uh, tagged with that, or I can also do a full text search, and that will even pull up any word in the entire document. This works with PDFs. It works with, uh, you know, um, the, uh, the rich text that you see uh, in this editor. Um, it's really good. I, I, <laughs> my life has been plus one since I started using Evernote. I haven't lost anything since then. Uh, so. I recommend that you even go all the way uh, and do away with your actual paper records to the extent that you can. Um, you know, just investing in a fairly inexpensive scanner uh, that you can use to then scan your, your paper documents and then put them into Evernote so that, that way everyone can find them. You've got them backed up. They're in the cloud. Um, and they're just 
you know, a whole lot more accessible and searchable uh, than they are when they're tucked away in a paper cabinet. Of course, you're going to need to keep a set of books, uh, hopefully before you start taking membership checks, um, and, and certainly uh, by for business. But I strongly recommend that you get a real accounting software like QuickBooks um, or, or another. But rather than trying to keep track of payments that you get, donations that you get, and, and things of that nature uh, on paper or in a spreadsheet, um, it, it really pays off to, to have a certain professionalism. Um, and you know, you're much less likely to lose track of, of the money. Uh, but it also supports reporting and analysis of, of your finances, which you're definitely going to want sooner or later. So I'd recommend QuickBooks. Uh, it's not free. It costs about $250 or so. Uh, but it will grow with you and uh, is interoperable with a lot of other systems. It's, you know, you're in very good company. It's a very popular option. Uh, it's the default choice for a lot of small businesses, nonprofits. Um, it's not hard to learn, and there's just a ton of information that's been written about it in, in books available uh, and, and lots of things available online, training videos, uh, you name it. Membership records. So this can be, often is, uh, kept in a very simple form like a spreadsheet, but it's, uh, it's really so much better to keep in uh, a comprehensive CRM system. So a, a CRM, Constituency Relationship Management, uh, goes way beyond keeping name and address. It actually keeps a record of each contact that we've had with, with someone, with our people. Uh, it allows us to share our relationships between multiple people that are organizing uh, so that each member of the team can be kept up to speed and that that way our co-op doesn't lose the memory of a relationship if you know, our one star volunteer moves to a different state. Uh, we still have that relationship in our, in our institutional knowledge. So a great CRM system that I, I recommend is Civi CRM. It's free, it's open source, it's very widely used. Uh, Amnesty International uses it for their fundraising and volunteer management. I've been using it for a number of years. Uh, we're using it now at Food Co-op Initiative, and a growing number of uh, startup co-ops are also using it for their membership. Uh, Civi CRM handles a large number of the uh, informational systems uh, and the engagement needs uh, for our organizations. And it also provides us a number of self-serve capabilities. So like running our email list, we can hook it up with PayPal and even allow people to self-serve their membership payment uh, over our website, you know, going straight into our CRM, our membership system. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about Civi CRM in the next section. I use it as an example. All right, your procedures, your orientation information, uh, and your, your history, all very important. Um, but you really just want these on your website. Uh, there's no sense keeping that stuff, um, that really important stuff that grabs people, you know, don't keep that buried in your, your filing cabinet. Uh, get that out in front of the public where they can find it and, uh, and soak it in. All right, collaboration. Um, so what we're talking about here is not so much uh, needs for a system, it really supports our goals uh, in our other areas. Uh, so, so, you know, effective collaboration systems help us get things done. But, you know, if we do it right, we're also building bonds and trust between leaders. And that's what face-to-face -face, uh, contact does for us. That's what, you know, sharing stories does with each other. Uh, and so we, we ideally want collaboration to be as much about face-to-face -face work as possible, as we can. Now, online, uh, Google Docs is my number one go-to for real-time collaboration. Uh, if you haven't used it recently, uh, I know it, it used to be pretty crusty, but they've done a ton of development on it recently, and it's really turned into a, a nice system. Uh, here you can see an example of two people working on the same Word document at the same time. Each of their cursors is highlighted, and that's, that's such a cool uh, feature. There's also Google Plus. Um, which I have adopted wholeheartedly uh, for, for exactly that face-to-face -face collaboration. Um, you know, webcams are really cheap, they're 30 bucks. Uh, if you buy a laptop these days, it comes with one. A lot of computers do, uh, but it's so much more engaging uh, and rich to be able to, to see the face. You know, the 90% of that, of that, of that uh, communication that isn't about the words we use, uh, 
um, that comes through when you can see body language, see smiles, and, and see all that stuff. Google Plus does this. It's free. Uh, it gets 10 people into a single chat. And, uh, and I just found out that recently, um, last month, they took my advice and they made it so that you can dial out of a Hangout uh, and connect with someone on the phone. So if not everyone on your team has a webcam yet, uh, but some people do, then those people can, can interact uh, with webcam and other people you can just dial in on the phone. Here you've got an example of, of people you know, meeting face-to-face uh, -face and they're working on a Google Doc at the same time. You can see all their cursors. And that, that's just, uh, just a really great way to work over the internet. And when we're not working in real time together, we're not uh, collaborating at the same time, we're, we're exchanging files and maybe working on the same files but different times, um, then you know, there's Dropbox. So, so Evernote is really great for storing files in the cloud, in our file cabinet, for anything that doesn't change that much. Google Docs is great for Word-style documents and spreadsheets. And then for everything else, there's Dropbox. Uh, so the way it works is it just automatically syncs uh, certain folders, uh, everything under this My Dropbox folder. Uh, it syncs that with online file storage in the cloud. It works great with large numbers of users, works on PCs and Macs and smartphones. Uh, it's free, uh, and most importantly, it's dirt simple. So you just copy a file to a folder, and there it is. It's also a very effective backup and revisioning system as you think about you know, how to increase the availability of your files. Uh, in case of disaster especially, but you can revert to previous versions of the file. Uh, and if ever your hard drive should crash, it's, you know, it's really not a question of if, but when. Uh, anything that was in that Dropbox folder is backed up in the cloud automatically. And last but not least, self-serve. So what are we going for here? Um, we're talking about removing any barriers to people being able to take action on their own. They need information, they need ability, you know, we're, we're empowering them. And then when we do that, wonderful things happen because now, you know, I, as the leader, uh, don't have to do everything, right? That people, people can do that themselves and it really just distributes that work out nicely. So a great example is all of our non-confidential institutional knowledge, you know, we just want that online. Uh, like which of these items do we want to, to make people ask for. Um, nothing, you know, we want them to find it and get so jazzed about our co-op that they want to immediately sign up for members, which they can on our self-serve website. Social media is, uh, is very clutch here. You know, we want to make our members and our friends, we want to empower them to be able to publicize our co-op for us uh, through digital word of mouth. And that's exactly what Facebook and Twitter are. Uh, it's just word of mouth on the internet. And so what we need to do is just make sure that the content that we're sharing is, uh, is shareable. It's on the Twitter network, it's on the Facebook network, and then our friends can, can pass it around to all of their networks. And then if we have a good CRM system plugged into our website, then all of those signups uh, we can just do automatically. Uh, people can help themselves on that too. All right, so those are the four main types of our systems. Um, and so now that we know a little bit about the challenges we're trying to solve, um, how can we compare between possible solutions? So what I'm going to recommend is uh, using criteria to evaluate each of these. Now I originally titled this slide, oh I'm sorry, I wanted to, to pause for questions here before we jump into criteria. Joel, do you want to tell me if anyone's asked questions so far? We do have a couple questions. Jim. Go ahead. Uh, um, <clears throat> We have a question from Charles Malley in, from Doylestown, PA, and he had a question. Uh, this is back on the section about record keeping. His question had to do uh, with uh, security options, and, and if maybe you could just speak for a moment on the concern regarding security, record keeping, and the cloud. I'm for it. Uh, security <laughs> is good. <laughs> um, you know, security is one of those things, there's never going to be an absolute secure, there's no such beast. Um, so really what you're talking about is risk management. Uh, you want to make something you know, as secure as it can be for your budget uh, with regards to, you know, relative to how much risk you're expecting. So uh, in general, Dropbox and Evernote, um, you know, their professional rec reputation is based on holding records confidential and protecting against security breaches. Often, I, I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that chances are that, that their security teams are probably 
working better than what we would do if we if we hosted things ourselves, um, especially online. So so to answer your question, I think it's um, it's never going to be perfect, but but it's probably good enough uh, for for our purposes. Now you know we want to be we want to be careful about the the not necessarily about breaches with um, you know people we don't know on the internet. Um, although if if we're maintaining any of our own servers, that's obviously, you know, whoever's maintaining the server really needs to be on top of that. But we also want to make sure that we're sharing information appropriately within our group. Um, and, and, you know, that, um, a lot of that is, is good judgment and common sense. Um, you know, I, I would make sure that you don't uh, keep things like, like credit card information and other sensitive information lying around. Uh, but, you know, generally the systems support uh, permissioning, they support having user I I accounts and passwords. So, you know, don't share it beyond the people that need to know it. Um, have good people and, and trust them. And uh, all of these systems are are uh, are detailed enough that um, that they can be used in a in a secure fashion. Is there another question? Great. We do have a question from Bonnie Hudspeth. She asks if you could perhaps share a few of the specific features of Civi CRM that you would use as a startup. You mentioned a couple um, off the top of your head, but uh, if there's other features that are compelling about Civi CRM specifically for a startup co-op. Yes. Um, so we used Civi CRM when we were, we were organizing on uh, Stone's Throw in Ohio, and that was myself and my, my co-lead organizer. Um, and essentially, whenever we had a phone call, uh, whenever we had an email, um, we made sure that, you know, the type up notes of that phone call or that email or whatever uh, was stored in Civi CRM with that contact. And so this just enables multiple people to have the knowledge of what was discussed at that meeting. Uh, and it's it, really easy to do. So, so then someone who's, who's new and coming up to speed three months later, um, when they get a call uh, from a member about, uh, you know, about their, their donation, for example, uh, and they have absolutely no idea uh, what the status of any donation is, they can very easily go into our, our CRM system, pull up that contact, and look at the history that we've had um, with that person, so they can look at the, the you know, the phone calls. Uh, they can look at the results of the meetings that we've had. They can just share that relationship and, and that knowledge, uh, and it, it's really helpful for, for handing off relationships between multiple organizers. And also, of course, you know, just preparing for inevitably uh, volunteers and staff will uh, sooner or later move on, uh, and so it can really help with those internal transitions. I would also use C CRM. Um, for my email list, um, you know, I want to have that data in there a single time. So once I've built my contact list, I want to use that exact same contact list for sending out emails. Uh, it supports putting people in multiple groups, supports tagging, supports really smart searching so that you can, you, I want to search for all of the people that, uh, that, you know, haven't placed an order in our buying club in, you know, over four weeks. Uh, bam, there's the list. I can send them an email. It's, it's really great at that. Um, or I can even do more complex things, like all the people that haven't placed an order in more than four weeks, except for the people that I emailed last week about the same thing. Bam, it does that too. It, uh, I mentioned the, the self-serve membership sign-up. Uh, that's a real clutch feature. And then also is the integration. Uh, so Civi CRM integrates with Drupal, and it integrates with Joomla, and it also now integrates with WordPress. So if you're looking for something uh, a little bit easier to set up and maintain. WordPress is a good option for that. Uh, so this allows you to not just take in information uh, from the public into your CRM on your website, but it also allows you to export information. So you can do something like having a, you know, a board directory or a member directory uh, available on your, on your you know, website to members um, that is just being you know, data that's being pulled from, from Civi CRM. So really a great tool. And, and we'll look in the, I'm using it as an example as we go through the criteria in the next section. So we'll dive in a little bit deeper. But thanks for, thanks for the question, Bonnie. 
at this point, I'm going to go ahead with the next section, and we're going to have uh, more time for, for questions after that. Okay, so as promised, uh, here is uh, some thoughts on criteria. Uh, so it is possible to, to evaluate our systems a little bit more critically. I would originally titled this slide, Evaluating Systems Objectively, and, and then I realized that was kind of wrong. Uh, we're still making subjective judgment calls about the systems. Um, there's, you know, there's still call for that. It's just that by, by breaking them down in different categories and evaluating them by the same criteria, evaluating every system by the same criteria, it allows us to weigh and measure and think more critically about the pros and cons and trade-offs between uh, potential systems that we might choose to use. So I think this is best illustrated with an example. So I want, uh, I want all of you to pretend that you are board members of your co-op, and I am your head tech volunteer, and we are currently maintaining our, our membership list uh, in a very simple spreadsheet in Microsoft Excel uh, on somebody's computer, and you've asked me to go and take a look at, uh, at other options we might choose for that at this time. So I've done that, and now I'm now ready to report back to the board. Uh, you've given me this list of criteria and asked me to keep that in mind as I've done my evaluation and to definitely use it in my presentation. So, so here I go. I, uh, I took a look. I did some research, um, examined that, and, uh, and I compared our existing Excel spreadsheet also to a Google Docs spreadsheet uh, and CIVI CRM for membership methods. So looking at, at cost, um, you know, Google Docs and CIVI CRM are, are generally free. CIVI CRM is open source software as well. Um, but you, we've got to look at total cost of ownership. So CIVI CRM uh, does some, you know, significant data crunching. It might require a little bit more in the way of a professional website hosting than we might have at this time. If we already have that, then it's not going to cost us anything more. If we don't have that yet, then, you know, we're going to have to pay for that. And so that, you know, I use, uh, have used DreamHost successfully in the past, and that's about $30 a month or so. So we've got to consider that. Um, how does that change with the number of users? You know, with Excel, we've got to buy another copy. Um, now, on the other hand, a lot of people already have uh, Microsoft Office, so it might not cost each of them. Google Docs is still free, uh, and then CIVI CRM, not affected by, by how many people connect to the system. Um, utility. So here's where something like CIVI CRM is really going to clean up because it's not, you know, our, our spreadsheet is really just doing that one thing. It's holding people's names and email addresses and, you know, where they live and, and whether or not they pay. It's doing that one thing. Um, CIVI CRM handles many, many functions, and it does it very, very well. So CIVI CRM, very high marks in the utility category. Training. Now, of course, all of that functionality uh, can, can cause increases in complexity. And, uh, and that definitely shows up as we look at CIVI CRM's numbers in the training category. So I've got a few questions to help us evaluate this. In terms of user centricity, uh, Excel, you know, dirt simple to use. Google Docs, not much less uh, for spreadsheets, um, maybe a little bit getting set up on the system. CIVI CRM, uh, you know, is, is making strides, but it's not there yet. It's very developer-centric. You know, it, there's a database underneath it. You can feel that uh, as you're working on it. So, that shows up when we're looking at how much time it's going to take to train people um, in particular. Now, CIVI CRM does have a very wide user base on the Internet. You know, there are thousands of organizations using it to do exactly the same sorts of things that we want it to. Uh, there's lots of available training material there. There are two excellent books written on the subject. Um, one of them is online for free. The other uh, is released from Pact Publishing. I've got it. It's excellent. Um, so it's not like you know the, there isn't uh, information out there. But then one more thing that's worth considering in this category is how many tech volunteers do we have that are capable of training newcomers to the system? Now, if I'm the only you know, techie volunteer at our co-op, uh, then everything's bottlenecking on me. That might, that might be a real negative that we want to consider uh, in, the, in evaluating the solutions. So availability, we talked a little bit about this with uh, the security discussion. Um, so, but uh, the first category is really, is this something that sits on one person's computer and is only accessible to them, or is this on the cloud? 
everyone can can access. Um, you know, Google Doc and Civi Serum both get the points there. Uh, and then and then how secure are we talking about? You know, you know, with Excel on someone's machine uh, is really they should get a virus uh, or you know theft or anything like that. Um, you know, that's that's going to be a disaster for that that single file. Um, that's something that Google Doc and Civi CRM are much better protected from. Um, data backup, you know, can that be automated? It can definitely be automated if, if we have that Excel spreadsheet in a Dropbox document. Uh, that's a that's a great start. Um, and then, you know, what level of of cat catastrophe uh, would be required to take this down? You know, I had to actually evacuate from from my home in August, uh, Hurricane Irene. So. You know, I was thinking about this with my backups. You know, even when I back things up off of my hard drive onto a spare hard drive to protect against hard drive failure, you know, it's still not protecting me against a flood or against a break-in. So clearly, storing things off-site in the cloud um, is a is a great way to make sure that it it takes a real big problem uh, before we lose any data. Support. All right. So this might be a little confusing. There's plenty of other people using Microsoft Excel and using Google Docs. But you know, we we home rolled our spreadsheet. We don't gain any benefits from lots of people using uh, a, a spreadsheet system. Um, unlike Civi CRM, where the number of, of people that are using it indicates that it's it's a great system for this problem. Uh, it also indicates that there are lots of people we can ask questions uh, of, and and you know, we get the the profits from that widespread adoption through updates and fixes uh, fixes and new features to the system. Um, so we're not dependent on locked in with any of them. Uh, it's good to think about. You know, is this one company that's providing a solution? Um, uh, you know, with a spreadsheet, we can easily copy and paste to something else. Uh, Civi CRM, again, there are thousands of people working on this open source software. So we're, you know, we're not at risk of any of them uh, stopping. It wouldn't affect our usage of the system. It's one of the beauties of open source. Uh, what would be our plan if we lost that key person? Now. Here, uh, a little bit differently, if I'm the only tech volunteer, though, that we have at our organization, I'm the only one who knows how our Civi CRM system would work, then, you know, what would happen if I get married or I have a kid or move out of state or whatever, uh, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not around as much anymore? That is potentially a, uh, a hazard, an issue that we really want to consider as we to choose solutions. In the lifetime. Um, so how is our system going to grow with us? You know, when we start thinking about using this for five years or ten years, our spreadsheet, we're definitely going to outgrow that. Um, no question about it. Civi CRM, on the other hand, is definitely something that will grow with us. It has grown uh, so much over the last five years, I can't wait to see how much it grows over the next five. Um, you know, a great example is this. The more organizations start to use Civi CRM, the more features it has. So uh, when there's a there's a hospital in California that wanted to use Civi CRM, thought it was a great system, but it didn't do case management, and they needed that for their patients. So they wrote the case management module uh, themselves, and then released that back into Civi CRM uh, open source. And now everyone's Civi CRM does case management. Um, another example is political campaigns. You know, they wanted to use Civi CRM. It's free. Uh, that's great. But it didn't do call lists, and it didn't do walk lists. So uh, they wrote that uh, capability as a new module and released that back to Civi CRM. Now everyone Civi CRM does walk lists and does call lists. Uh, so that sort of growth is really going to make Civi CRM excel uh, over the next few years. And extensibility. I kind of talked about this. Um, how well does the system play with other systems and data? Well, we can copy and paste that of Excel and Google Docs, but that's about as far as it goes. And as far as extensibility, I mean, that's not what it does. It does one thing um, reasonably well, and that's it. Whereas with Civi CRM, with its open source and with its modularity, uh, many, many users are developing new features for it and extending it. Uh, it can be interoperable. I've integrated Civi CRM with QuickBooks, for example. Um, other people are working on that, too. And, and then the last one down there, is the strength of the community of developers. It's really something that's worth finding out. You know, it's a big difference between open source software that's in use in you know, thousands of organizations and open source software that's in use in you know, a dozen. Uh, they're both open source, but 
But open source is really only powerful when it's also widely adopted. Uh, so good to, to keep in mind. So overall, considering all of these criteria, uh, the final scores on a, on a simple little five-point scale, um, you know, we see that uh, we see the Google Doc uh, just copying and pasting our current spreadsheet into Google Docs uh, might be a, uh, a step, an easy step up. And then, you know, Civi CRM, while while it does higher in these points, it may be that some of these categories are more important than others. So if we're really ready to to grow and look at that utility, there's an area that Civi CRM clearly dominates uh, spreadsheets. On the other hand, maybe I'm the only tech volunteer, uh, so maybe training is a more important criteria. And, and in this category, we might want to make the jump to Google Docs, um, and then perhaps consider, you know, wait on Civi CRM until we until we find those those tech volunteers that will help us um, with this training disparity. Or uh, perhaps it's time to think about, you know, we're replacing our system. We want something that's going to grow with us all the way through the rest of the organizing and on into opening the store. So you know, we can add up several of these categories: utility, lifetime, extensibility, and and then clearly here. Uh, Civi CRM really shines. So, you know, it's just a, a simple way of, of thinking critically about some of these questions and, and trying to find a way to compare some of these solutions to each other in our many options. Um, these are the uh, softwares that I have mentioned today. And of course, this, uh, these slides will be shared. You'll get a link to how you can download them so you don't need to furiously scribble everything down. Um, and I am happy to uh, have been able to present for you today and would love to throw it open for questions. And as we mentioned at the beginning, uh, we're, we're not in a hurry to, to turn off the lights and rush out of here. So um, if you have extra time and really want your question answered, please stick around and we'll, uh, we'll try to get to as many as we can. And with that, I turn it back over to you, Joel. I've been addressing some of the questions that have been coming in. Um, there was another question regarding the security issues. Um, that's Go kind ahead. of specific. Uh, let's see. Yeah, it was just, uh, let's see, there was a question about access control, limiting the views of records by role of requester. So having um, basically across all these various cloud-based services, how do you uh, how do you make sure the people that need access to certain things have access to certain things? Uh, in a very general sense, I would not be paranoid. Um, the question would be, if we had a paper filing cabinet, how would we be able to do that? Uh, and the answer is we wouldn't worry about it, right? Like maybe we'd lock the file cabinet. Uh, or maybe we wouldn't. And certainly if there's confidential employee information, personnel information, then maybe we wouldn't put that in that filing cabinet. We'd, we'd have a separate, secure, lockdown file cabinet that you know only the people that, that needed that information would have that. Uh, so that's, you know, that's a good way to think about our, our online systems as well. Uh, if we've got a file cabinet that you know, anyone who's, who's working on the co-op um, would have access to that paper filing cabinet, you know, we can, we can feel generally safe about giving them the electronic filing cabinet too. Um, online, you know, we might not always know who did what in a paper filing cabinet, but online we'll be able to track that information. So, there, you know, there's an electronic trail uh, if we're really worried about something. But I, I think in general, you're running into more trouble here being paranoid than you do uh, being, being open. Um, now, as far as uh, as individual records, uh, Civi CRM actually supports a very high degree of um, of uh, detail um, and how detailed you can create access control lists. So, if you really want to spend uh, a lot of time, um, you know, very granularly uh, tweaking down who ha who can access whose email address. Then, then Civi CRM uh, can support that. But in, in general, I would say just you know make sure that it's the people on the inside uh, that you know that have access to that file cabinet. Don't put anything in that file cabinet that they shouldn't be reading, and uh, and you'll generally stay out of trouble. Use a use a separate maybe maybe not online system if you really do have confidential information like employee personnel records and things like that. Great, that was great. Um, we have a question from Christy Renner. She asked. 
can you identify the differences between Evernote and Dropbox? Um, and can I choose just one? Uh, well, you, you can you can choose whatever, um, anytime. Uh, Dropbox is it looks like a file system. So uh, what I love about it, it's, it's you know it's like a cross-platform file system. I started using it just to exchange files uh, with my fiance who's on a Mac, and then all of a sudden smartphones came out, and so then you know my Android could have a, copies of the files too, and it's just you know whatever it was, all I had to do was copy into Dropbox, and any of my devices, any of my uh, shared computers could access those files uh, exactly as if they were on the local. So that's that's really useful. Um, what it um, what it doesn't necessarily do is is replicate like a paper file cabinet. I find that with Evernote, um, Evernote kind of includes uh, a text-based editor. Um, you might have seen. I wonder if I can go back. Um, but uh, you know you can type in it. So if I'm sharing uh, files that I would write in Evernote, and I've, I've since moved all of my note taking, everything else into Evernote. Uh, so that anything I write is automatically saved, it's automatically backed up, um, and, it's, and it, it's automatically in the system that I search when I'm looking for things. Uh, support for tagging is really clutch. So I guess um, obviously they have some similarities. Uh, I don't believe Evernote does any kind of uh, version history, so I can't roll back to an earlier version of a note or an earlier version of a document in Evernote uh, as I could with Dropbox. Um, but at the same time, I, I find that Evernote has that filing and tagging capability uh, that Dropbox doesn't. And it might come down to uh, choosing which metaphor you most like uh, for your files. Uh, do you want something that's in a file cabinet that's very easy to find? Or do you prefer thinking of things as, um, as like a, a computer file system and you kind of walk through um, a, a directory system? And that's all. I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> Great timing because we should probably do a closing and let the folks sign off who would who need to get on with their days. Um, but we will stick around um, if there's other questions uh, after the closing. Stuart? All right. Well, great job, Jake. Thanks for that. I'm sure we will have a lot of people doing some research and being interested in following up on this one, including me. Uh, I encourage all of you to sign up for the rest of our series of webinars. If you Each one needs to be registered separately just for clarification and, and uh, just go back to the website where you signed up before and we'll have, uh, I think, three more to go. So uh, thanks again for coming. Thank you to our host uh, Joel and the CDS Consulting Co-op for their tremendous support for this project and uh, encourage everybody who's listening if you haven't already signed up for our contact list if you do we'll make sure you know about any future events like this thanks again